All right. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, you're here to discuss higher education is in trouble, but AgTech can save it. So today uh, you have with you, I'm Jason Hubbard. I'm Vice President of Growth at Sales Intel. And we have Roberto. I'm not even going to try and pronounce your last name, Roberto. Yeah. <laughs> Torjani. <laughs> uh, from, uh, from Ripen. Uh, I'll let you do a quick intro for yourself, uh, Roberto. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Torjani, as Jason mentioned. Uh, I've been in higher ed sales for my entire 20-year uh, career. I've had the uh, privilege of working at some large publishing houses, uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, Pearson McMillan. Um, I'm now with Ripen. Uh, Ripen is a company uh, that is out to uh, eliminate graduate underemployment. So we partner schools, uh, students, and companies together so that students can uh, start working on projects uh, for business problems in their classroom and then get familiarized with real business needs before they even graduate, which gives them a leg up uh, once, they, once they do graduate. Great. Uh, real quick, just uh, let everybody know who Sells Intel is. Uh, so Sells Intel is a, a data partner um, for people that need uh, data information on buyers in the business to business space. Um, so early on, higher ed was one of our early focuses, uh, primarily because our founder, uh, Minoj, uh, his, one of his previous companies that he had started uh, focused on higher ed and ed tech. Um, so this was something that was close to, to his heart. Uh, so one of the things we, we talked to our researchers about focusing on early on uh, was going through and verifying and building out the database for uh, higher ed buyers. Um, we offer promised 95% uh, accurate human verified data. Uh, so all of our data, it's first machine processed, then it's run through a team of researchers that actually go through and manually hand verify all of those records before they're published. Um, the next one is really important given all that's going on right now. We have over 48 million uh, work mobile numbers. So for people that are trying to get in touch with people and running into issues trying to get uh, you know, people to pick up on uh, at their desk phones, at the office, or from switchboard, uh, you know, we just released a study from one of our partners. Uh, dialing into work mobile numbers right now gives you a seven times lift in connection rates. Um, and then we also have our uh, research on demand team uh, that's available for custom research projects. So if you find data in our machine process data that's not been hand verified yet, you can flag that as a research on demand request uh, and have that prioritized for the research team. Or if it's not in the system at all, they can go out and get the data for you. Um, so just real quick, what, what Cells Intel is, um, we'll hand it over to Roberto for the rest of this. Great. Yes. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, yeah, today's agenda, it's a very broad one. Um, you know, this is not going to be an exhaustive list of every trend that is shaping the future of higher education. So I just want people, uh, you know, to definitely ask questions at the end. If I don't cover off, uh, off a topic that you want to uh, talk about, feel free to ask me at the end. Happy to answer that or we can email about it. Uh, we're going to go and start with the trend shape in the future of higher education, then get to how COVID has exposed, you know, some areas for improvement, how higher ed is developing the tools that we need, and then what the future of higher ed education has in store. And that's where I hope to engage the audience. We have a fairly uh, sizable group, well, uh, a manageable group, I should say. So uh, we should be able to take questions in that last area and we'd love to hear some thoughts from uh, the attendees. All right, Jason, yeah, so let's get bored. Yeah, with that said, uh, as we go through this, please go ahead and pop your questions in the uh, Zoom side panel. Uh, we will make sure that we uh, reserve at least five minutes at the end for Q&A. So as things occur to you, go ahead and pop those in there and we'll make sure that we have time to cover those. Great. Yeah, so thanks, Jason. So uh, the trend shaping the higher, uh, higher education, future of higher education, I mean, but really, we have to just get the big one out of the way, the most obvious one. Everything is moving to online learning, even if classes are in person. So outside of the humanities and social sciences courses, I would be absolutely shocked if there isn't a digital component to a course coming out of this pandemic. 
So starting fall, if uh, you if there's a course out there, um, you know that doesn't have a digital component, that is a ripe area for picking if you're in that um, specific discipline area. Um, STEM disciplines have always been trailblazers, but lately we've been seeing uh, some other folks, um, you know, get their foreign languages has a pretty good offering now. Um, you know, humanities are still lagging a little bit, but for the most part, you're going to start to see a good portion online. And even if you're not doing an online component, either via homework or something, there's a good chance that your actual class may be online as well. And we'll get to that in a second. One of the biggest things, obviously, you know, that we also have to really just uh, get out is the, the fact that the justification for every dollar spent is going to be heavily scrutinized. Universities are asking departments to cut budgets left and right. Um, you know, a few conversations that I've had over the past few weeks, see their budgets are totally frozen. Um, you know, they're not, they're not moving or they're, you know, greatly reduced. And if we go uh, just look at the universities and how uh, they're facing these major changes, their financial health is dire at best. You know, their revenue is taking a huge hit as students, particularly international students, stay home. Schools that typically benefit from large endowments are also in trouble. Um, they're not immune to fallout from the pandemic. So that's just, it's something that really affects everyone. And then if we go deeper and talk about how decisions are made, uh, let's say for course materials, you'll also find that academic freedom is in jeopardy. And for those on the call that may not know what uh, academic freedom is, academic freedom is the freedom for any professor or lecturer to choose what they use for course materials and assign those uh, to the class. So, you know, in this COVID age, uh, that independence is going away there needs to be more structure. So departments are looking at solutions that can span the entire department, not just a single professor's course. Um, more and more, we're just looking at and hearing, you know, one big question. And that question is, is your product muscle or is it fat? Because schools are all about fiscal fitness right now, and they're definitely cutting the fat. The last trend uh, that everyone has to prepare for is, especially uh, if it's going online, is the diversity of learning styles um, in any given situation. So are you a visual learner? Um, do you need to read, write? Do you need to touch something and you know work with it in order to see it work? Uh, there's gonna have to be a lot of stuff done. The traditional lecture, um, Jason and I were talking about this yesterday as, as we, you know, went through when we were in college is gone. There's no more, um, you know, just talking head up front and everyone taking notes. Uh, people have to adapt for that. And especially if you can't get back into the classroom, there's really gonna need to be some thought around this. Next slide, please, sir. Oops, there we go. So one area of improvement, even though they moved to it re really quickly is obviously still online learning. So even though all schools have moved online, they haven't yet gotten all the wrinkles out. I'm sure everyone uh, has heard some horror stories or maybe even had children uh, that were, um, you know, going through school and, you know, couldn't get connected or for some reason, you know, just had some trouble completing some coursework. It's difficult. So simply delivering course materials through a platform is not the best way to teach students. You have to think about accessibility, compatibility of devices. Does it cross disciplines? For example, do you have a physics product that engineering students can use? Or is it only for physics students? That's really important right now. Can your product ease that transition? I think one of the biggest and most uh, widely neglected value props for any company when they're talking to um, anyone in the higher ed space is something that we take for granted, but something that's still very valuable, and that's time. The most widely adopted products in higher ed save professors and administrators time. This includes the learning curve. It can't be too steep or else it'll never gain traction in that department. So speaking uh, from Ripen's viewpoint, we, we save administrators five to seven hours 
uh, during the course of their week during the semester uh, with administrative tasks um, and project management tools. Does your product offer that? Uh, that's a key decision making. And obviously it's a pain point for everyone. It's a universal pain point. So being able to speak to that when you're talking to your clients is vastly important. Third point here, uh, purchasing and delivery. How is your purchasing process now that the procurement department is separate from say the college of business, everyone's working from home. How are you facilitating this? Um, you got to think about how long it's going to take to get through those procurement channels is the only way to purchase your product through the physical uh, campus bookstore. You know, um, this, this is going to be important. You have to have enterprise options and student purchase options as well. And this bullet point should actually be above, but is your UI easy to learn? That's one thing that I wanted to include with the online learning, um, just to make sure that folks can, you know, get up to the speed and gain that traction. You know, they'll have to be able to get sped up pretty quickly and they're gonna have to be able to access it quickly as well. So how's EdTech uh, developing tools need to reshape? Uh, some of these are, uh, you know, not, not the obvious ones, and I wanted to highlight them because they weren't so obvious. Um, one thing that students, especially digital natives, are used to is having everything at their fingertips. If you think about just, you know, their social life, everything is at their finger, fingertips. Uh, you have uh, TikTok. Instagram, instant gratification all the time. Guess what? They expect that in education as well. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Giving students access to more information about how they're doing uh, gives them feedback quickly. It allows them to make that transition. If you talk about that 20 years ago when you had to wait two weeks to get your midterm uh, test back or your paper back and know where you were in the class, you couldn't really pivot you are lost, right? You have the midterm and the final and that's it. That's not the case nowadays. The companies that are doing this best are applying um, practical learning skills and then giving students immediate feedback on, on those skills quickly. One thing that uh, companies will also need to do is support new teaching models. This is what the pandemic is gonna do. We're gonna see a lot of co-teaching, uh, team teaching, especially in those rigorous capstone courses as it gets to the end of someone's um, uh, undergraduate career. Um, you're going to see a lot of these and they're probably going to straddle a few subjects. So if you're a business major, you may have a marketing and a business course blend. It may be team taught and that's a new reality. Platforms are going to have to adapt for that, being able to have different hierarchy and different users and different permissions on at the same time to accommodate students at scale, which is very important here. Gone are the days where you probably have many people in a class, especially if it's online. Being able to scale to a large audience is going to be crucial uh, for folks to survive. And then one of the additional things that I think gets a lot of attention um, in some of the for-profit schools, but not necessarily in the traditional higher ed schools, is competency-based education. So competency-based education is exactly how I have it on the screen. You master a skill at your own pace, right? If you want to show a potential employer that you have these skills necessary, you should be able to pass a test, a rigorous one, and be able to get some credentialing or badging. That's gonna be very important. And I think traditional institutions have been hesitant to take that on uh, as of yet, but it's something that we're starting to see even just in the workplace, reskilling, upskilling, badging, it's all very popular. Um, you know, people are looking for certifications left and right to show that you know, they can do more. This is the really broad area that, you know, uh, I, 
I'm going to hit on a few points and I'll probably talk to a few others, but really what the future of education, higher education looks like is the experiences that engage. The way that students learn is changing, as I mentioned earlier. Look for more engaging experience, such as project-based, even if it is online. For example, ripen pairs students uh, in a classroom to work on a project for, say, a automotive dealer, maybe a marketing research um, project for them, but students from the same course working on the same project in order to do that. Engagement is how other people learn, um, whether that's with your professor or from other students in a think pair share model, uh, which is still very popular. You're gonna have continuous learning cycles. Gone are the days where uh, things fit into a normal nine to five, normal business hours. You know, this is when I do work, this is when I leave work. You know, again, 20 years ago, in order to study, you would go to the library, perhaps you'd grab a study room, maybe have some classmates sit with you, but the library would close at say nine or 10. And then that was it. Well, that's not how people study anymore. As a matter of fact, um, you know, students, uh, especially in undergrad, are studying later and later, uh, especially when they need to cram for a test. And we also see continuing ed and adult learners that are returning to school after coming home from work, after, you know, tending to the family, putting the kids to bed, they are now hopping online. What does that mean? So not only do they have to complete their coursework, but they have to have a product that is compatible uh, with learning uh, off hours. So do you have help and FAQs to support these people uh, during, during that time? Can they get immediate answers to questions you know, after normal working hours? That's something that we're gonna have to all think about um, as uh, vendors in the higher ed space. And the two major things actually launched me into my uh, next slide, but I'll go ahead and talk to them really quickly here. The importance of soft skills. So with students being digital natives, sometimes they do get their uh, eyes glued to the screens a lot. And that's something that uh, the employers are noticing when they enter the workforce. They're lacking the soft skills that are necessary to survive uh, in the common workplace. Now, a lot of that shifting, but you know, some things still, um, still hold true. Professionalism, leadership, critical thinking, those all have to be mentioned. Um, and then the last thing that you're gonna see in education is adapting to the workplace and job prep. So schools are gonna have to start providing job training vetting services, even connecting uh, students early on in the process. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you'll see schools um, have, you know, uh, invite employers to campus for recruitment day. That's not enough. There is such a, uh, a flood of students coming into the workforce right now, especially during this pandemic when a lot of jobs have been cut. They're going to really be twiddling their thumbs if they don't have have the skills already necessary to step into their first job, extremely important. And then they'll also have to adapt the coursework to meet employer needs for workforce expertise. I'm uh, uh, very lucky in this instance because this is exactly what Ripen does, but every company needs to think about, can their product get that student ready for life after college? Um, it, it's just being becoming like more asked of, even for, for professors that have typically shunned it um, and just stuck with the course material, we're seeing more and more of it. And just like I mentioned, the last two bullet points last uh, launches me into this last slide. And it's just, it's a stark difference from the reality, uh, perceived realities of both the students and employers. Students think uh, themselves proficient at professionalism, almost 90%. <laughs> employers differ greatly. Leadership, same thing, stark contrast. Communication, critical thinking is the big one. No longer 
uh, our employers looking for someone to just execute a simple task. They're looking for that student to go in, think about the problem, think about all the possible solutions and outcomes, and to select the best one. And then just like we all heard in algebra class uh, back in the day, you have to show your work. Why did you select this? What was your rationale behind selecting that? Uh, critical thinking is a huge component of this. Lastly, you have collaboration and digital technology, and those are uh, very uh, close together, so they're not that far off. Um, students um, are collaborating a lot more, again, uh, getting into groups, working on projects, so they understand that pretty well. And then digital technology, this is the one where students consider themselves profession, and this is the only one that they're lagging behind. Um, students are by far more proficient than they think when they enter the workforce. As a matter of fact, students are starting to even work with technology such as Salesforce and HubSpot, things that we use often in the business world um, for us. So these students are actually getting hands-on training on tools that they may use uh, later in work. Now, I'm going to touch on a couple other things that I didn't talk about um, really quick. Um, just give quick mentions and see if this sparks some great discussion, but things that you can expect to see more is blurred modalities, no more um, online and traditional face-to-face. -face. It's like all going to merge together. Um, you're going to see multiple multidisciplinary approaches. So things are going to straddle several disciplines and support applied learning and more adjuncts are going to be moving between fields. And then really what you, you're going to see is students are going to expect um, or institutions to become more corporate. And what I mean by that is they're going to want ROI. They want to know if they attend this institution that they're going to get an education that's going to land them the job they wanted. So knowing that um, going into school is going to be very important. Uh, you've probably heard stories already about students wanting to take a gap year this year to wait out. Why is that? Because that's that college experience is so important uh, that they, they don't want to start off their college experience online. Some will, some won't. But what they do expect once they hit campus is that they expect that that um, education that they receive at that institution will land them the job that they need once they graduate. I'd like to open up to questions here. We only have five minutes. Um, yeah, it looks like we have one already in here. Uh, Two parts. Um, so, asking, uh, assuming Zoom, Ring Central, Microsoft Teams, collaboration tools like that are uh, the core daily interactive solutions for online learning. Uh, so, one is, it, does that capture most of them? Are there ones that uh, that we should be aware of uh, beyond those? There, there are a couple that are education specific. Um, so, uh, Campus Wire. I would suggest you look at that one as well. That is um, probably gonna be more on the academic end because what it is is really a back channel that allows the professor to uh, have a dialogue with the students either during the course or uh, outside of it, um, shared materials. So think of a uh, skinny LMS, um, you know, and being able to send files and everything else. So that's another one that's emerging in ed tech. But the ones that you just named off, Jason, are very popular and will get the most notoriety, especially from institutional leaders. And then the second part of that question, uh, what, are, what are some of the primary challenges that you see with these types of solutions? And are there uh, specific improvements or features that, uh, that you would recommend or you see coming down the pipe? Yeah, so the problem that you always have is uh, you're gonna have overload at an institution and especially if decisions are made in a siloed conventional way. So let's say the College of Business uh, picks Microsoft Teams, but um, you know, uh, College of Communications uses um, Zoom, right? Um, students that are just coming in, they're gonna have a learning curve, they're gonna have to learn multi-platforms. It's better for them to decide. I would say if you're part of these groups or, or looking at these technologies, the, the thing that you'll want to do is try to get a uni unified stance. And if it can't be across the entire campus, at least do it in your core college. So if you're in the College of Business, try to get something um, uh, really just standardized for, for that uh, one area of your campus. And as far as part two of that question with the hurdles, um, 
you know, one of the things I think Zoom can also do better is, um, you know, there's things, you know, we all do when we're at home, we may start to check Slack or look around. I think being able to lock screens, especially when you talk about K-12, um, just lock the screen experience so people can't surf. I'm not saying that should happen in the workplace, obviously, <laughs> and give those freedoms, but uh, be able to focus and push content to students in an instant. Being able for students to um, circle something and then push it back to the professor and then it being cataloged under that student's name and ID. So for example, Jason's my professor. He pushes me a question. I circle the United States on a map. I push it back to him. It submits and it goes into um, my grade book. That's really going to be the future, the next step for the Zoom-like products in education. Great. Um, yeah, as anybody else has any other questions, pop those in there. I've, I've got a few for you. Um, so one, uh, piggybacking off what you said as far as uh, you know, having silos or multiple uh, departments or decision making, uh, for those that are trying to sell into higher ed, um, are, there, are there insights or strategies you have to trying to get those different departments to talk to each other? Um, you know, I know oftentimes you wind up you know, getting a foot in the door in one place, but then it's a struggle to get uh, to get discussions going or introductions going in other parts of the campus. So, you know, one, do you see that, uh, you know, starting to improve as far as breaking down the silos? And two, are there strategies for, for trying to aid higher ed institutions in doing that? Yeah, so great question. And that, that really is um, becoming a thing of the past. And, you know, if you've had a hard time calling into campuses uh, in the past, um, you should really try again, especially if you don't just live in the higher ed space. And the reason for that is uh, people are now at home. Uh, Sales Intel, thankfully, they, they have uh, a great system where they provide uh, mobile phone numbers as well. But you're not going to ring that office phone and get someone. And they're being mandated to check with their peers that, you know, maybe students would touch this department in this department. So what you're seeing is administrators and professors alike reaching out to other, you know, uh, departments that you, they know their students are going to be part of. For example, sociology courses, they're going to have to reach out to criminal justice and psychology. And they're probably making decisions together, uniting on a, uh, a core piece of um, uh, software or uh, learning materials. I think that's great. And how I would approach this is I would actually take a top down and a bottoms up approach. So if you have a SDR that can email the lowest rung of that um, ecosystem, and then maybe you as a VP or whoever else approach the top end of the administration and meet in the middle, that way all parties are aware of the technology uh, when it comes to their desk. And that way you don't have to elongate your sales cycle. Um, that's what I would recommend, especially if you have SDRs that can't get in touch with folks right now to just try to push the conversation upwards. Great. And then one other, you, you touched on this, um, and I'll try and be brief and we're coming up at the end of the time. Uh, but yeah, you touched on usability adoption, um, you know, time to get trained, uh, you know, all of those kind of factors and, and getting people up and going on it. I know from my experience as a doctoral student, a graduate teaching assistant, um, you know, a lot of the professors I worked with were, you know, were kind of stereotypical, older, not, uh, not necessarily uh, technologically savvy, uh, oftentimes resistant to change. Um, you know, one, uh, that may just be my anecdotal experience, but two, uh, assuming that that is uh, at least fairly common, uh, do you have do you have advice on how to kind of try and tackle that? Um, because obviously, even if you get the foot in the door and you get uh, you know you get a purchase decision, if you can't get adoption and you can't get uh, and you have essentially a failed deployment, then you know you're highly likely to turn out. So you you kind of. Uh answered your own question, Jason. And then that was the fact that your graduate TA, uh, that's a ripe, ripe spot to reach. So if you do have that talking head up front, that stereotypical professor that doesn't typically deal with vendors, uh, the people that are most impacted by a lot of these decisions are oftentimes the TAs. 
especially for these large lecture courses, right? Where a bulk of the enrollment is going to go, where a bunch of revenue is going to go to. Uh, I have a course at Penn State. Uh, I think they have a 13, 14 TAs in one section alone. It's like 800 students. So they make decisions on the product. And I thought that was really unusual until I started digging in and finding that it wasn't. So if you can't go to the stakeholder themselves, trust me, there's someone uh, beneath them. And if it's worth value, um, like those large, large courses are, you're going to want to talk to those folks anyway. So if you're wasting your time talking to a professor that just doesn't want to talk to you and it's for 30 people, just you realign your expectations about where you're going to be engaged and where your revenue is going to come from anyway. And look at those um, lower level courses that might have a bigger enrollment or ones that touch uh, different uh, colleges within the, the university. Right. And we have one more uh, that came in uh, asking about uh, messaging and content between a uh, top down and bottom up approach. So how do you how do you tailor that based off of your your audience and, and where they where they come in out of that strategy? Right. It's all about the value props to, to each of those folks. So for the bottoms up approach, they have to start with, you know, with the value props of that person that they're talking to. Maybe it is the TA. Maybe it is, you know, uh, uh, adjunct professor. So you know, time obviously is going to be the big one um, that you're going to want to start with, you know, if, if that's it, but sell, sell the features there. Don't feature dump, just talk about the things that will benefit them and then tell them that they have things that would benefit their, you know, uh, folks in their administration as well. Now, folks that are starting at the top, they're obviously going to want to take a holistic approach, talk about why this is, you know, a muscle product instead of a fat product, how it uh, solves a lot of their problems. Um, administrators are always going to want to know how the licensing works. I would say be flexible, have various uh, flex pricing options. Don't be stuck on your own uh, old pricing that you've been hammering, you know, be open to new ideas, but also speak to these administrators about the time and efficacy. And if you can show ROI or any type of reporting, you know, like in a Tableau or, you know, that sort of um, reporting, that's really when you're going to get their attention. Reporting and uh, showing ROI is going to grab them. Then you grab your SDR, your lower rung person, and then you just have everyone on a call. And that's really where the harmony comes in because people can then see that you've spoken to each and every individual that this product's going to touch and that you've identified their needs. Right. Yeah, and I think one one thing to add there too, and I mean that's just because it's higher ed doesn't mean that it departs from you know best practices and B two B selling and marketing in general. And you know one of the best things you can do there is have conversations with those different decision makers. Um, you know, talk to them, figure out what their pain points are, figure out what they're interested in, and then tailor your outreach and your content to to what you what you've heard and what you've learned. Um, yeah, there's there's no substitute to talking to those people and, and getting actual real real feedback from them. Great, I agree. All right. Well, uh, we're about five minutes over. Um, if anybody has anything that they're uh, they didn't get to ask or anything like that, just reply to the email that you'll get with the link to the deck and the recording. Uh, but other than that, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Roberto. This was, uh, this was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.